Check this out. The recent Brewer community goal has added new frameshift drives to the game and has brought a, an Imperial Courier build closer up to the surface from where it was. I wanted to highlight this build without the frameshift drive modifications since most people in the community that didn't get a chance to participate in that goal before it was completed. This build becomes more practical with more jump range. Um, as it stands right now, without the Brewer modifications that are available, uh, you're going to land somewhere in the low to mid 40s. This is a moderated build. It is possible with some aggressive weight shaving that you can get this up into the high 40s. Um, I don't know if anyone, at least nobody that I know, has managed to push a courier over 50. If you happen to have a build that can do this, um, go ahead and post it in the comments below and um, other people can consider attempting to implement it. I'm building this particular ship for the average explorer who's not aggressively min-maxing or who isn't interested in trying to babysit their modules while they're exploring. So this is a moderated build that tries to strike a good balance between all of the different advantages with a particular emphasis on jump range and real space speed. That's an important characteristic for the courier because this ship is primarily focused on exploring planets on flying around the surface in normal space on getting to and from planet surfaces quickly, which makes it useful if you're trying to uh, knock out all of your different codex discoveries in a given sector and you want to try to get all the brain trees and all the different types of space coral, for lack of a better designator. Most people know what I'm talking about when I use those descriptors, but there's a lot of living things that you can find out in space. And they're on planet surfaces where big ships have trouble finding places to land and take a long time to be able to get to those landing sites. So this is a ship that's meant to tackle those specific types of challenges, which makes it a really good material farmer and a prolific mid-range explorer. Because of the jump range limitations without brewer modifications, you're not going to be able to get into the fringes of the galaxy. So I wouldn't recommend trying to get out to the edge of the galactic arms. That's pretty much the realm of ships with more than 50 light years and some with more than 70 light years. This is a really good general purpose explorer for the main areas of the galaxy, basically from the bubble out, maybe a couple thousand light years and everything from the bubble inward. Couriers are really, really good explorers. They've got really good view lines, especially if you happen to have VR, it's a fun ship to fly. It feels like a fighter jet and that makes it a really entertaining experience. Now for the build's core setups. Basically, every explorer I'm aware of has heavy-duty Great 5 and deep plating. That's bread and butter for explorers at this point, but it's not critical because this ship is set up to run with shields. So if you don't have the materials or you don't want to spend a whole bunch of time unlocking that particular engineer, you can just run standard lightweight alloy and you'll be fine. For a power plant, low emissions Grade 5 and monstered. This is to give us plenty of power headroom to put all the other stuff in. If you wanted to shave weight, you could buy yourself a lot more headroom by putting a smaller power plant in and power managing your optional internals, hard points, and utilities. That is totally an option. It is totally legitimate. And if you feel like doing that, go for it. You can get the Imperial Curry to do some pretty impressive things if you're willing to uh, pay it that much attention. Enhanced performance thrusters. This is what I would consider to be a key attribute of surface exploration ships. You want to be small, you want to be fast, because you don't want to waste time traveling and you want to be able to fit most places when you get there. The Imperial Courier excels at this because it has a smaller footprint even than the DBX. And enhanced performance thrusters just really bring that up to the surface because the DBX, since it uses size 4 thrusters, is pretty slow, since using size 4 thrusters means you basically got to use D-rated thrusters to preserve jump range. Some DBXs use A-rated thrusters. It's possible to make that fit and get a ship that's reasonably fast, but there is no possible way to modify a DBX to go 814 meters per second when boosting. That is a big deal, and it's super nice. It's why I like flying the ship. It's why I actually use it more often than I would think. 3A frameshift drive. These stats reflect the standard grade 5 blueprint for increased range and deep charge. It's important to remember that when you are using small frameshift drives, deep charge is better. I believe the dividing line is when you step up from a size 4 frameshift drive to a size 5. Once you hit that size, around the size you would be flying a crate in, you want to be using Mass Manager. It will give you better gains. 1D life support, lightweighted for obvious reasons. There we go. 
a 1D power distributor with engine focused grade 5. I have this stripped down. You could potentially put cluster capacitors or super conduits in there. I don't think either one's going to compromise your boost capability. In fact, I can test that right now. What it will do is make you one meter per second slower, and it doesn't really have much influence on how often you can boost. You do not have the headroom with a 1D power distributor to perma boost. That is strictly the realm of larger distributors. You'll have to sacrifice top speed and jump range in order to get that if you want it. I've found that a 1D is adequate for most circumstances. Uh, if you want to do something different, that's totally your call. I like to have more sensor range when I'm running a ship that has the headroom for it. So I have two A sensors lightweighted on here. You can put two D sensors in here and lightweight them for even more jump range and a little bit more speed. 3A fuel scoops. So we're going to get into the optionals now. Um, I like to run A rated scoops when possible. If you're on a budget, especially with bigger ships, a lot of people will run Bs to save a little bit of power. It does increase your refuel time from 45 seconds empty to 52 seconds empty. 3H Guardian Frameshift Drive Booster. It's the largest the ship can outfit. It gets you basically eight light years of extra jump range for a pretty good hit on your power consumption, but it it's worth the sacrifice. 2G Planetary Vehicle Hanger. The G-rated variant is the lightweight one that consumes more power. I tend to prefer that because more weight means a lot more uh, stress on the frameshift drive and less jump range overall. There are some rare circumstances where, depending on how your power plant's set up, sometimes running the other Planetary Vehicle Hanger can get you more jump range or lets you run a smaller power plant, which will let you sacrifice more weight. This is one of those circumstances where you should be experimenting in Coriolis to figure out what suits you best. I can give you some of the, the basic foundational stuff to get started, but to, to find what you like the most, this is a really good place to play because it's free and you can just imagine whatever you want and test it to see what its actual numbers will be in game before you spend hours and hours grinding to build one of these things. 2A, Auto Field Maintenance Unit. A-rated Auto Field Maintenance Units are the best Auto Field Maintenance Units. A lot of people think that bees are better because they have more ammo capacity, but Coriolis also tells you how much integrity these modules can repair. You'll notice 64.4 here for repair. Go up to the 2A, you get 70 repair despite having less ammo. The AFM can repair, the A-rated AFM, sorry, can repair more module integrity, and it does so in less time. What that equates to is a faster repair cycle for any damaged module. This means more if you're doing neutron highways and you have to stop to fix your frameshift drive because it means you'll spend less time parked around a star waiting for your frameshift drive to be repaired. Uh, I also recommend them because they are more synthesis efficient, especially if you can fit larger ones. But the courier in this particular configuration is just fine with the 2A. If you're going to take neutron highways with the ship, you should have AFM synthesis banked up. Depending on the length of your journey, you might need quite a bit. So plan ahead and keep an eye on how your resources are being consumed. Because if you run out of synth out in the black, you've got to find a green system in order to get more, and that is several hours down. Some people like to go that route, other people don't. It's an aesthetic choice. Just keep in mind the consequences of either path. 2D shield generator, enhanced low power grade 5 and low draw. This experimental is essential for this particular ship build because the shield generator is a thirsty beast. And uh, this makes it a very, very nice uh, low power module to have. Um, I use low draw to reduce power on, to reduce strain on the distributor in the event the shield gets damaged. And 10% uh, power draw reduction does mean a lot in situations like this. Super Cruise Assist is an essential tool for explorers. It's autopilot, it's free time that you can get back from the game if the game asks you to do something really, really boring, like flying between a binary star with 500,000 light seconds of distance between the two. You could basically go eat dinner, take a shower, take a crap, come back 30 minutes later and find your ship neatly parked in a tight orbit around whatever body it is you wanted to explore. Advanced docking computer. This module has received some really nice additional functionality with Odyssey. It can now auto land on planet surfaces that don't have any infrastructure. I absolutely adore this functionality because when you're exploring, every explorer has come into a situation where they want to land on a planet and the surface is too rough for you to be able to find and attach to. Uh, this 
module takes your sensors, basically instantly finds a place where your ship can fit and squeezes it in there nice and tight so that you don't have to worry about messing around with your lateral thrusters trying to get everything to work right. This is especially convenient on large explorers like the Anaconda. It just knows where to go and you're on the ground in seconds compared to spending three or four minutes messing around trying to figure out where you can fit. Uh, the Imperial Courier, because as a small footprint, means you can fit in even more ridiculous places and the docking computer can find some pretty crazy landing sites um, if you're willing to trust it. Detailed surface scanner for obvious reasons, engineered expanded probe scanning radius because it means you don't have to be as precise with uh, scanning planet surfaces. You can get everything and hit your efficiency targets without too much trouble. 2F pulse laser. I highly recommend that every explorer run at least one hard point so that you can trigger guardian beacons and interact with other potential things that you can find way out there. Uh, lightweight grade 5 and flow control because you don't need to deal a lot of damage. You usually just need to tap guardian beacons a couple of times to get them to charge. Imperial Courier is actually pretty good at that. And this is gimbaled because it consumes less power and uh, is easier to target since you're not you know, trying to do any advanced combat or anything. Heat sink launcher, lightweight grade 5. Keep that weight down, jump farther. The utility mounts here could also be equipped with frame shift wake scanners or uh, Xeno scanners. There are some interactables way out there that react to scanners in general. I don't think that they're sensitive to a particular type. Most explorers that I know, if they have to pick one, will pick the Xeno scanner because there is alien life out there, and you know maybe you'll find Thargoids or Thargoid sites that this could interact with. Frameshift wake scanner is totally optional. In either case, you need to power manage these modules, so if you stick them in here, turn them off until you need them because you're running at 94.5%, and I'm pretty sure that any one of them is going to push you over the mark. You do have to run with your cargo hatch off in order to get everything to work here, but you don't have a cargo rack on this build anyway, so there's no reason to have it on unless you find some materials to scoop, in which case just turn one of these others off. Um, most people who run this will probably just turn off the AFM, which gives you all the headroom you need to run basically anything you want, including probably one of the scanners. You can stick that in here actually and test it real quick. I don't think that the Xeno scanner is very power intense. Nope, actually even, I think, let me turn this back on and see where we land. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can stick a Xeno scanner in here and still have enough power headroom not to have to manage anything. So uh, if you're interested in doing that, that's the one I would recommend. Uh, frame shift wake scanners can get really power intense when you start engineering them, although I'm pretty sure you could slap an E-rated in there. Oh yeah, you can. Um, E-rated fits in there without too much trouble, but you are uh, knocking your jump range down pretty significantly, so you got to be aware of that. Um, the frame shift wake scanner can be lightweighted, which gets you back up to 42. The Xeno scanner is not engineerable. So uh, that's, let's see, anything else I forgot? Nope, I think that's it. So that's a good example of what you can do. Um, this is a really good starting point, and from here you could basically just play with anything you want to make this particular build yours. I like to try to be flexible with my builds and moderate with my setup so that people have room to play. So uh, that's all I got for today. Um, if you have any recommendations for builds you want me to cover or any requests, let me know in the comments below. And if you are one of those commanders who's manage to get this over 50 light years, uh, post your build in the comments so that everyone else can see and uh, potentially run comparisons to figure out, have a better idea what they would like to do if they try to build one of these ships. Um, let's see, that's, uh, yeah, that's all I got. So I will catch you guys later.